Well, I am so, so thrilled and honored to be with you today. I first just want to thank Dean Reese and my good friend Anthony for that wonderful uh, and kind award and those uh, beautiful words that they shared. Uh, Anthony, I'll just say on a personal note, and Dr. Anthony Harris is one of my pandemic buddies. <laughs> we met during the pandemic working on some projects together and I quickly came to admire his intelligence, his kindness, his compassion, and his service mentality. And uh, we just became good friends. So it's really an honor to be here with, uh, with both of them today. And to Dean Reese and to Dr. Allen, to all of the faculty, staff, and trustees of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, uh, I am just so blessed to have the chance to be here today. I also want to congratulate Dr. Lockwood uh, and my uh, dear friend and colleague, Dr. Fauci, uh, and as well, Dr. Reese, for the conclusion of an extraordinary, extraordinary 16-year tenure as dean of this great school. But most of all, I'm grateful to be here on this special day with all of you, the graduates of the class of 2022. Before I share a few thoughts with you, I want to acknowledge some incredibly important people in this room. The people who have supported you on your journey to this very day, and your parents in particular, your dear friends and other family members, your community of classmates, teachers, and mentors. None of us get to this day alone. We all get here because people helped us and supported us and stood by us on this very challenging and wonderful journey uh, to become doctors. So whether they are here with you today or not, I want you to know that those people whose love made today possible, that we thank them and we honor them on this special day. Now, each of you graduating today, you have so much to be proud of, but not only because you completed medical school, but because of how you did it. You had to navigate medical training during the worst pandemic our nation has seen in a century. I think back on those early days in particular, before a vaccine was available, when we were still learning about COVID-19, it was a scary time. And many of you went from learning in the classroom to learning on Zoom. In the hospital, you had to suit up in protective gear and try to explain COVID-19 to frightened patients and their families. You had to comfort those same families when they could not be present to hold the hands of their loved ones. You had to all do all of this knowing that you were often putting your own health at risk, taking the chance that you might get sick yourself. Yet despite all of that, you continued to show up day after day. Because even though you hadn't yet taken the Hippocratic Oath, you had already begun to live up to its call to serve those who need our care. And you didn't stop there. Many of you went on to find creative ways to serve outside the hospital as well. You ran PPE drives and coordinated medication deliveries to high-risk individuals. You got trained in how to vaccinate patients so you could staff community clinics. You fought the scourge of COVID misinformation by building a data bank, the name of which I love, COVID Up to Date. And that helped make accessing the latest information on COVID guidance and recommendations much easier for people. And even as we were forced apart, you made sure that people weren't alone as you coordinated with programs like Adopt a Grandparent, Movable Feast, and Charm City Helping Hands to make sure that Baltimore's most vulnerable people felt supported in their moments of need. And I've often believed that moments of crisis reveal our character and in this crisis, you showed who you are, caring, dedicated, and unquestionably brave. As we think ahead to what follows this day, to what's in store for you as you proceed throughout your wonderful medical career, there is no doubt that there will be incredible opportunities. There's also no doubt that you will be inheriting a world that is gripped by profound challenges, not just COVID, but I'm also talking about the rising rates of chronic illness, our national mental health crisis, the scourge of poverty and racism, the threat of climate change and new pandemics. With so much to manage and with so much uncertainty in the years ahead, how do we all stay true to the core mission of medicine? And how do we sustain ourselves in the process? Today, I'd like to suggest that we do so 
by anchoring ourselves to three commitments. Three sacred commitments that define the highest ideals of healing and that can guide us through the challenges ahead. The first commitment is to stand up for the value of every life. Now this might sound obvious, but it's actually not. Because we live in a world where countless voices tell people every day that their life is not valued, that their worth is dependent on the color of their skin, or their gender, or the people they love, or the God they worship, or the sound of their accent, or how much money is in their bank account. But our responsibility as doctors, whether we're in West Baltimore or anywhere else in the country or the world, is instead to affirm and to protect the value of every life, especially in the face of these inequities. Our job is to declare the dignity of every life, to declare the dignity of black lives, to fight hate against Asian Americans and others. It's to look out for patients who don't have food on the table or a safe way to get to their appointment. It's to be there for people who feel unseen and invisible. And we must do this even when it's hard or bureaucratic or comes at a high cost. I say this knowing firsthand that speaking out can be costly. People may accuse you of being controversial and say a doctor's place is to stay away from controversy. It's to stay quiet. It's to treat the patient who's in front of you. And you have to be prepared that this is the criticism that you will receive. This is why when you see that the color of someone's skin is tied to a shorter life expectancy and you say that racial injustice is a health issue, people may say you're being controversial. It's why when you see patient after patient with gunshot wounds and you say gun violence is a public health crisis, people will say you're being controversial. It's why when you see 10 black people murdered in the aisles of a grocery store and say, And when you say that white supremacy is a threat to the health and well-being of all people, people will say you're being controversial. But I'm here to tell you that when speaking the truth is disparaged, it's controversial, it is still our responsibility to do it anyway, because that's what it takes to stand up for the value of every life. Now, as you do this, and it won't be easy, but as you stand up for the value of every life, you quickly realize that the lives of the people that we take care of, they're not confined to a single silo. And so we must not be either. Our voice and engagement are needed not only in the hospitals and clinics in which we provide care, but in the world outside those clinics where health is ultimately determined and driven. So the second commitment I want to share with you is don't stay in your lane. When I was practicing medicine in Boston, I saw young men and women who were depressed because they wanted to live fulfilling lives. But they went to schools and measured their worth with test scores and acceptance letters. I treated patients with diabetes who knew it would be good for them to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, but they couldn't because the nearest grocery store was an hour-long drive away. I cared for elderly people who had been instructed to walk more to improve their health, but it wasn't safe to walk in their neighborhoods. All of them were stuck, and as their doctor in clinic, I was stuck too. But years later, when I became Surgeon General, I got to witness how clinicians could help strengthen the fundamental building blocks of health outside the hospital as well. I met psychologists who brought social emotional well-being uh, programs into schools where kids could understand their emotions and recognize their self-worth. I met advocates who brought mobile farmers markets and community gardens uh, to communities that had previously been considered food deserts. 
and I met doctors who build a movement around the country for groups to walk that now brings neighbors together to exercise and build community. If these clinicians had stayed within the traditional understood boundaries of medicine, they may have only spoken up in conversations about immunizations or food pyramids. But today there are communities that are healthier and stronger because these doctors had the courage to say, this is my lane. They had the courage to imagine a world where the work of healing shapes our schools and our streets. Now you may all think to yourself, am I really wanted in these other places, in these other sectors that are outside of medicine? And I can tell you that you are not only wanted, but you are very much needed. Today there are teachers all over the country, teachers who I meet as I travel our great, uh, great nation, who look at their kids who are restless and lonely after too much time spent learning through screens, and they want to know what their schools can do to support their kids' emotional health and well-being. There are employers who recognize the mental health struggles of their staff and want to know how they can support them. There are mayors who are seeing rising rates of diabetes and obesity in their cities, and they want to ensure their constituents have safe places to walk and to purchase healthy food and to host a neighborhood picnic. All of these people are waiting for someone like you to validate their concerns, to guide their understanding, and to be a partner in creating better health. None of us can do all this work and take all of these risks alone. We'll all need people to support and guide us on our journeys. Which is why the third and final commitment I'm asking you to anchor to is this. Put people first, at home, at work, and in all parts of your life. It's the relationships that you build and sustain that will be your greatest source of strength in the years ahead. They will soften the sting of disappointment, and they will give you strength during hard times. They will ground you when you are feeling lost, and they will amplify your moments of joy. And when we fail to sustain our relationships, the result can be painful. This is a lesson I learned the hard way. In 2017, my life changed overnight when my first tenure as Surgeon General ended abruptly. After three years of public service, of chasing a standard for success that had been defined for me by pundits and outsiders, I was suddenly separated from my work and from the colleagues I loved. I had no idea what to do. I spent months struggling to find direction. In addition to losing my community at work, I had also allowed my trusted community of family and friends to drift apart. The cumulative effect of many small moments of putting work ahead of the people I loved was that I felt profoundly alone and isolated. Now I wanted to call these friends, but at this point I was ashamed to ask for support when I hadn't exactly been a supportive friend to them when I had been in office. Feeling distant from the ties that had nourished me for so long led to a deep sense of loneliness, and that loneliness paved the way for self-doubt and for shame as I came to question my own self-worth. It took me more than a year to find healing, and it didn't come ultimately from professional pursuits or a new job or new awards or new publications. It came from people. I once asked a classmate of mine in one of these 2 a.m. philosophical conversations that you have in college, which I know some of you have had too, I remember asking him, how do you define a friend? And he said, a friend is someone who reminds you of who you are when you forget. We all need people like these in our lives. For me, it was my wife, Alice, who stuck with me during these tough times. Alice is right over there, <laughs> sitting in the front. And Alice did what best friends do. She reminded me that I still had the capacity to give and to receive love. My mother, my father, my sister, they came to visit and call me every day to let me know that my worth was not based on my job title, but on my humanity. My friends Dave and Sonny, both doctors as well, they formed a pact with me during that time 
we decided to create a moai together. A moai is an Okinawan tradition where a small group of people make an explicit commitment to look out for one another, no matter what life may bring. Now, though we had known each other for many years, Sunny, Dave, and I, we committed on that day to video conferencing together once a month and texting each other during moments of joy or worry in between. We also committed to talk about the things that friends don't talk about often enough. Our fears, our dreams, our health, our finances, and our failures. Over time, I slowly healed. I laughed more. I appreciated the small moments of wonder. And I started looking ahead rather than backward. I healed because of the people in my life. At a moment where I felt like my soul had a deep tear in it, they patched me up with their acts of love. That is the power of human connection. It makes us whole. It focuses us on what matters. It reminds us of who we are, especially in those dark moments when we forget. And we will all forget from time to time. Because the world will keep telling us that our worth is dependent on where we did our residency, on how many papers we published, on how much grant funding we received, on whether or not we got tenure. But I want you to know right now something that I want you to hopefully remember for the rest of your lives, which is that the most important qualities that you need to be a healer in society are the ones that you actually had long before you arrived at medical school. The ability to care deeply for others, to listen compassionately, and to lead with love. Despite everything the world may tell you to the contrary, that is in fact enough, and you are enough. It is the people in our lives who love us who will keep bringing us back to this truth. And today, all of you are joining a sacred family of healers. Healers who for generations have stepped up to face the great challenges of their time, from smallpox and yellow fever to polio and now COVID-19. Healers who sought to shape society not just with the power of their knowledge, but also with the strength of their values. As society's newest leaders, the choice of what kind of society we build going forward, the choice of how to lead, that choice now begins with you. So choose to stand up for the value of every life. Choose to get out of your lane and choose to put people first. That is how you can help build a society that is vibrant, inclusive, and strong. A society where we are all healthier and happier because we look out for one another. I will leave you today with a practice that you can turn to during those moments of doubt and loneliness that will inevitably crop up in your lives. I want you to take your right hand and hold it up and place it gently over your heart and close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And think about the people in your life who have supported you in your journey to this moment, your dear family, your close friends, your treasured teachers and mentors, the people who have been with you during your moments of celebration and joy, the people who have stood steadfast by your side during times of disappointment and pain. Feel their love flowing through you, strengthening you, guiding you, and filling you with peace. And know that love is always there for you, no matter what happens in this world, because it resides within you. Now, open your eyes. What you felt in those few seconds was the power of love. Love is the world's oldest medicine. 
stronger than perhaps anything you and I may ever write prescriptions for. It is what I wish for you more than anything else in the world. Your ability to give and to receive love, that is your greatest gift. It is also your greatest power. And it is what will sustain you for every step of the journey that's to come. Congratulations, class of 2022. I wish all of you a lifetime of happiness, fulfillment, and joy.